Hello and uh, a very warm welcome to this evening's event um, entitled 30 years of EU migration and asylum policies, success or failure. This event is hosted by the European Institute of the LSE and uh, it's also part of our own 30th anniversary of the existence of the, of the Institute. My name is um, Eiko Thielemann. I'm an associate professor of political science and public policy at the LSE. Um, and I'm also director of the graduate program here at LSE uh, entitled International Migration and, uh, and Public Policy. I'm delighted uh, to be able to chair this event today and delighted to, to welcome our panel of, of speakers. Before I do, I have a couple of housekeeping um, rules that I want to, to, uh, to briefly mention. This event is being recorded and hopefully there will be a podcast uh, available um, shortly. The um, event will, be, um, will consist of a number of initial presentations followed by a discussion. And then I, I hope we'll have plenty of time for a question and um, comments from the, from the audience. Um, for those of you on Twitter, um, the hashtag for tonight's event is um, LSE EI30. Um, and uh, you, might, you might see that also in the, in the, in the chat um, um, shortly. Um, so, um, let me, um, let me perhaps just set the scene for tonight's uh, discussion. Um, 30 years ago, um, the Maastricht Treaty created for the first time an EU competence um, for the field of asylum and immigration. It created the so-called Justice and Home Affairs pillar. Many regarded that as an extraordinary step, um, given that of course, asylum and immigration matters are often regarded as at the core of uh, member states' uh, national um, sovereignty. It clearly was um, controversial then, uh, 30 years ago, um, as I guess highlighted by the fact uh, that we had a number of member states opting out um, of cooperation at that time, notably, of course, um, the UK, um, Ireland, um, but also, also, also Denmark. But of course, uh, controversies have not disappeared um, and they arguably have, um, have, have increased. Um, we um, obviously, obviously had, have had lively discussions over the years um, during the um, Syrian crisis and um, an assessment of what the EU's role within that crisis was. Um, lots of discussions about alleged fortress Europe. Um, we know about the the significance of, of migration issues also within the, the Brexit debate. And more recently, of course, we had the crisis at the polish belarusian border. Um, and, um, and that's just um, a selection, I guess, of controversies that we've seen in, in recent years. So 30 years onwards from the Maastricht Treaty, today might be a very good time to uh, take stock about the role of the EU more broadly and to and to ask questions about the extent to which EU policy should be um, deemed a success or failure in achieving key objectives, um, such as a better management of um, migration flows in Europe, more effective protection um, for asylum seekers and refugees, or um, the objective of a fairer redistribution, redistribution of, of responsibilities, um, across Europe. To explore some of these issues, um, let me introduce you um, our panel of eminent uh, speakers. Um, we have um, Sophie Magenes from the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, um, um, who's um, working in the, in the Brussels office as a, as a policy and legal um, officer. Um, we have Florian Trauner um, from the Free University of Brussels, who is also a visiting professor at the College of Europe. And we have our own, um, very own Natasha Zaun, a member of the European Institute, um, who is an associate professor of, um, of migration uh, studies. I will give each speaker um, 
time of five to 10 minutes uh, of opening remarks. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a, a first initial uh, discussion about some of the issues raised. And we'll go in the order of the program. So I'll hand over to, to Sophie to, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Aiko. Let me start by, by thanking you and thanking the LSE for the invitation uh, to speak at this evening's event and a very happy Valentine's Day to everybody who's tuning in. Your commitment to the cause is very noble. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, and also to be sharing this platform with, uh, with Florian and Natasha. And I'm very look much looking forward uh, to hearing your comments and, and all of the questions that will come later. Taking this moment to reflect on 30 years of migration and asylum policies is very timely. Uh, in recent months, the events in Afghanistan, at EU borders with Belarus, which you mentioned, Aiko, and tensions regarding Ukraine have prompted important questions about whether the lessons of larger numbers of arrivals in 2015, 2016 to the EU have been learned. Is the EU better prepared now to manage any increase in arrivals? And can progress be made on reforming the way EU member states manage asylum? In order to tackle these questions, it's also important to look back and reflect on the progress that has been made. I would say that significant progress has been made since the Treaty of Maastricht of 1993. Under that treaty, EU member states committed to collaborate on asylum and migration issues. However, that commitment was limited to the intergovernmental level with limited involvement of the other EU institutions. In 1999 then, the Treaty of Amsterdam granted the EU institutions new powers to draw up legislation in the area of asylum. With the adoption of the TAMPER programme in October 1999, the European Council, and by this we mean the EU member states, decided that the, that the common European asylum system should be implemented in two phases. Uh, and, and as you mentioned at the beginning, Aiko, this, these developments were, were a great shift away from the principle of these issues being totally within the realm of the solidarity of, of, the, uh, of the sovereignty of EU member states and shifting to something where such issues would be really shared with other states and with the institutions. The first phase of the common European asylum system, also known as the SEAS, defined common minimum standards for the reception of asylum seekers and set out rules and qualification for international protection, so meaning refugee status and other kinds of protection. Um, and it also set out the procedures for granting and taking away refugee status. It brought, it brought what were called the Dublin arrangements which had been dealt with in other agreements between states, it brought those into the common European asylum system. And those Dublin arrangements are the arrangements which uh, decide which member state is responsible for looking at an asylum seekers application. There was also additional legislation covered, um, including the temporary protection uh, directive in the event of a mass influx a good piece of legislation which unfortunately has not been used to date. All of this was significant progress from things where, stood, where things stood back in 1993. There was then a second phase of this SEAS, the Common European Asylum System, which was implemented after the Treaty of Lisbon, which entered into force in 2009. And that treaty moved a mark away from just establishing a minimum standard into creating a common system, something that would be a, a truly common set of rules comprising uniform status, so the same kind of protection status for people and the same procedures that asylum seekers would go through. These so-called second phase pieces of law uh, include what are called the recast qualification, reception conditions and asylum procedures directives uh, and a reformed set of Dublin arrangements, again, deciding which member state is responsible. These new laws largely came into effect in 2012 and 2013. And then 
EU member states and other institutions really encouraged the EU member states that were part of these laws to transpose them quickly, meaning to implement them quickly into their, into their national law. And there was a reason for this haste, because as we know, the EU experienced greatly increased arrival numbers with over a million people arriving to the EU irregularly in 2015 alone. This development um, caused quite a bit of uh, panic and unease within the EU, and it prompted the adoption of additional measures. So new things on top of this um, set of laws that had been long agreed and planned out since 1999. These included um, an emergency relocation mechanism, which was agreed after a lot of political strife at the European Council level, and was a special mechanism which aimed to relocate 160,000 asylum seekers from main countries of arrival to other EU member states. And in a way, those difficult discussions are still around in the political discussions that we have today. A defining moment then came with what's known as the EU Turkey Statement, published in March 2016. And that statement sought, amongst other things, to implement the return of asylum seekers arriving to Greece from Turkey back to Turkey. The statement was essentially a press release and it was developed outside of the normal way of doing business in Brussels and without the usual consultation process. For example, there was no consultation with the European Parliament on what was going to be in this statement. In the aftermath of what has been termed the European refugee or migration crisis of 2015, and in a return to the normal way of doing business, a further series of legal reforms were proposed by the European Commission in 2016. These proposals aimed to transform much of the common European asylum system from directives, which are laws that require uh, uh, an EU member state to implement it into their national law and to change them instead into regulations which have immediate legal effect. The vast majority of these proposals remain under consideration today, even though they were published in 2016. They are now largely part of what's called the Pact on Migration and Asylum, which was published by the European Commission in September 2020. 30 years on, it's clear that a lot of progress has been made with EU member states working together and EU agencies such as the European Union Agency for Asylum and Frontex providing greater support to EU member states. However, the discussions on the pact and the things that were proposed in 2016 are still ongoing. And I'm going to quickly flag before closing um, three key challenges that we still see. One is the issue of solidarity and responsibility sharing. The Lisbon Treaty explicitly provides for the principle of solidarity and fair sharing between EU member states. Then in 2009, the Stockholm programme adopted, adopted by the European Council emphasised the need to promote effective solidarity with member states facing particular migration pressures. Similar commitments have been expressed by states in the years since including the Global Compact on Refugees of 2018. However, agreement amongst EU member states on how to share responsibility for persons rescued at sea and other contexts remains elusive. The current French presidency of the European Council is seeking to make progress on this issue, and there are grounds to be optimistic that they may be able to make some progress. Achieving some level of agreement on this issue is a key concern for UNHCR. The second big challenge is respect for the rule of law. Over the past 30 years, great gains have been made in developing robust legal safeguards for asylum seekers and migrants. These include the prohibition of refoulement, which means asylum seekers cannot be turned away at EU borders prior to admission to the territory and fair procedures. Unfortunately, the laws are not being respected with pushbacks and other human rights violations occurring at various EU borders. UNHCR has repeatedly expressed concern at such practices and called for them to end. And thirdly and finally, uh, another big challenge is global solidarity. 
with the vast majority of the world's displaced living in developing or middle income countries, over 85% of them, UNHCR is calling for more support to the countries that host the majority of those displaced. This includes humanitarian and development support. It also includes a greater commitment by developed nations to resettlement and complementary pathways. Unfortunately, COVID had a massive negative impact on the resettlement of refugees when refugees were unable to travel due to restrictions. UNHCR has urged EU member states to resettle at least 36,000 refugees this year and 42,500 Afghans over the next five years. With the USA now emerging as a key resettlement actor, we hope that European countries, including the UK, can enhance and implement existing commitments to resettlement. So those challenges still remain, and we hope that discussions on the pact um, will help to advance some of these key issues. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, it was great to hear that um, despite some of the criticism that the EU has received over the years, um, you, do, you do see some grounds for optimism, um, even on kind of contracted issues such as the, the, the pact, and maybe that is something that we can talk about uh, a little bit more um, in the discussion later. Um, I'm happy to hand over to, to Florian Trauner now, um, who um, will uh, give us his opening statement. Thanks, Aiko. Hello to everyone. Uh, also, big pleasure from my side to be here and a happy Valentine's Day. Uh, I will follow up on Sophie's very nice introduction with some bit more political science uh, perspective, let's say, uh, uh, and a bit less legal in the sense I will already spoil my argument and say it uh, in the front. Uh, I think, having looked again on the Master's Treaty and read it, whether the article is there, if you really look back, you could argue that after all, the Maastricht Treaty hasn't had that much influence on what we see today at the EU asylum and migration policy. However, the decisions taken by a few member states at the time, roughly the time when the Maastricht Treaty was signed, are still deeply shaping of what is happening today. So there is a distinction between what happened in Maastricht uh, at the time of Maastricht and what happened directly uh, in Maastricht when uh, the EU states back then met in February 1992 and signed the treaty. Let's start systematically and look uh, into the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, you can see that it was all framed, also asylum migration, under the heading provisions on cooperation in the fields of justice and home affairs. It was actually very short, only 10 articles or so, uh, and it said uh, asylum, immigration, border control are matters of common interest. So there was really no talk about harmonization, uniform standards, all the things. It was, it was considered to cooperate on these issues because it was necessary to achieve other objectives, primarily economic objectives, primarily free exchange of goods uh, in Europe and uh, already with the Schengen cooperation that is taking form there. So it was really a spirit uh, and the rationale of limited cooperation because it had to, had to happen to achieve other objectives. Uh, as Sophie mentioned, uh, unanimity among member states, supranational roles had a very, uh, supranational institutions had a very limited role. Uh, so it was all uh, relatively cautious and prudent in, in terms of setup. It really happened then is the Treaty of Amsterdam that there was also a shift in the mentality uh, and the, the more ambitious area of freedom, security and justice was set as an objective. That said, uh, there were still two intergovernmental laboratories before or roughly at the same time than the Maastricht Treaty that really shaped what we are seeing today in migration policy. On the one hand, the Dublin Convention that was signed by 12 member states outside the EU's legal framework as an international convention in June 1990. So it established, Sophie also briefly touched upon, it established a system of responsibilities within the European Union. So since that moment, it was only one member state that was in charge of dealing with an asylum application, usually the member states first entering in con into contact with an asylum seeker. So there was this uh, option, uh, this, this belief that uh, asylum seekers no longer should have the choice to go wherever they want. It's up to authorities to decide uh, uh, where their protection claims are to be examined, usually uh, in the territory which the first enters. 
Uh, and the second uh, uh, big intergovernmental project back then was uh, a little surprisingly the Schengen uh, uh, agreement signed in 85 for the first time. So it, it had the objective to establish a border zone, uh, a, a Schengen area without internal borders and a, a common external uh, border control system. It took 10 years and not agreement until this objective was realized, uh, but it was really a very big step for the European Union. And it created, if you want to say so, big questions also for the EU's interaction with the outside world in the area of migration, particular migration asylum as well. In the event, the, the Schengen area created a very liberalized migration regime within Europe. It was not even called migration, it was called free movement of persons, uh, EU citizens. I mean, in within Europe, no one is referring to other EU citizens as migrants, the UK being probably or was uh, the major exceptions in this regard, where it, it continued to be dis discussed at EU migrants. Everywhere else, it's more EU citizens. Uh, so if you have a very liberal migration regime within a continent, the question is, how liberal can you be to the outside world? Uh, and here we can see, uh, I mean, I, I broad brush here a bit, but the tendency is that uh, you can see that the EU still became much more restrictive to the outside world, the more liberal it was in the inside world. It was not always like this. You could see up to at, uh, immediately after 1999, before 9-11 attacks, there was really a push by the Commission to create a comprehensive migration regime, also to uh, a more liberal uh, uh, regime to certain third countries, having this idea uh, uh, for uh, labor migration taking really off uh, at EU level, uh, but there was a clear shift back to more restrictive uh, uh, priorities post 9-11. Uh, one of the key objectives at EU level has been to control undocumented migrants arriving to the European Union and to use the EU's leverage to return all those who are found ineligible to stay in the European Union. So that should be the, the key priorities of the European Union and, I mean, also to protect uh, uh, those in need of protection. Uh, but here again, we can discuss it later to what extent uh, the EU has not focused on not giving them access to the EU's territory. Uh, and as Sophie said, uh, in terms of, of showing international solidarity, uh, you may argue that there could be done more at EU level too. Uh, and the second question relates then to the internal, uh, uh, basically set up here again to the Dublin regime. Dublin regime uh, brought really, I mean, brought clear lines of responsibility, if you want to say so. It was meant to deal with two phenomena. The one was uh, asylum shopping, so that asylum seekers go to a, a state in which they have higher probability to get asylum. And the flip side of this phenomenon, refugees in orbit, that no authority says we are responsible for an asylum application so that they are just wandering around in Europe and each authority is saying, no, the other state is responsible. So with Dublin, these two phenomena should be tackled. Uh, there was clear line of responsibilities. Uh, states at the border take more responsibility, if you will, to say so. Uh, and this brought from the very beginning the question, how do, you know, is it to be complemented? Because it creates... Uh, a strong responsibility burden in terms of or responsibility in terms of, of refugee protection on there. Uh, it's also still relatively unfair for asylum seekers, because even if, as Sophie already outlined, there is an effort to create a common European asylum system, it does make a very big difference uh, where an asylum seeker submits an application. And what we have seen basically since the last 10 years are debates in Europe how to complement it. Should there be a mandatory relocation quota that it's more evenly distributed? How should it be that the standards are more uniform? And we have seen that it's politically very difficult to go ahead. I mean, it's not rocket science as such. You would need to have probably uh, a strong EU agency with more uniform Europeanized asylum uh, application systems. You would have, yeah, standardized procedures, uh, but it's a question of political will. Uh, and the political will uh, is not very uh, uh, in, in, in basically it's not existing in huge quantities in some uh, members of the council. Think of Viktor Orban and friends. Uh, so in a way, it seems 
also with the migration pact that it's very difficult to really create a breakthrough and a real shift away to where the Dublin system has brought us in the 1990s. We have thought it for a very long time, uh, and you could argue that uh, it doesn't look very uh, promising uh, that anything uh, of really substantially different will be achieved in the current negotiations. So possibly in retrospect, the leaders in the 1990s should have given the EU already more competence back then to come up with, I don't know, with a, a bit of a more comprehensive uh, system uh, uh, that includes not only clear lines of who is responsible, but also more clear lines of what to do uh, that uh, the cooperation is more uh, is fairer and uh, migrants are also, I don't know, more equally distributed uh, within Europe. Uh, just food for thought also for the discussion, what could be done if policies are really locked in right now? You may argue again in favor of more avant-garde groups uh, that break through right now the current lockdown and you, you go ahead uh, with, with small groups of countries that that creates such more uh, Europeanized, uh, in particular, asylum systems, uh, and hopefully bring up the, the uh, bring along the other member states. Uh, question is, what are the strong in, uh, uh, incentives for the other member states to go along? Back then, actually, Dublin and Schengen were somehow interlinked, uh, and right now it's not so easy to find an incentive that is as strong as Schengen was back then for member states to participate in Dublin. So this is the, the big question to have, but uh, I think to end, we always have to hope and uh, that things will eventually come up with a more, with a better functioning and a, 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 a asylum and migration system that is also characterized by more solidarity and fair resp responsibility sharing. I stop here for now. Thank you, Florian. Um, I, I was delighted to, to hear that you're highlighting the, the importance of Dublin, which obviously has uh, enormous implications in particular for the issues around solidarity um, within the European Union. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll come back to, to some of those. I think you also raised an interesting question about to what extent some of the developments that we've seen in this field have been driven by a concern about migration from outside the EU or whether these issue linkages that you were talking about, whether they were really driven by a concern to protect certain achievements like Schengen, maybe like free movement and other aspects of the, of the single market. So I think um, those, those are maybe also questions that we, we might want to uh, come, come back to. Um, I, I'm sure Natasha will also say something about solidarity. I think it's an issue that is hard to avoid in this in this broader discussion. So I'll hand straight over to, to, to Natasha for her opening remarks. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Aiko. Um, and yeah, my, my presentation will, in a way, very much draw on, on what has been said already. So I follow up a bit on, on, on Sophie and also um, Florian's um, statements. And what I will do is, is present three potentially controversial um, statements that aim to explain some of the fundamental um, design or yeah, address some of the fundamental design flaws um, of EU asylum policy making that perhaps still um, haunt us today. Um, and and um, particularly thinking here on, on the problems that, that the EU has in the common European asylum system with um, non-implementation, uh, weak uh, commitment to solidarity, um, yeah, di diverse uh, protection standards across uh, across member states, and also the deadlock um, in the 2016-2018 uh, reform, and also kind of the current state of the um, the um, mi migration pact. So the, the first statement is um, that um, in a way EU asylum policies are really mainly or have been introduced um, as a distributive element um, early on. Um, so, yeah, as a, as a way really to redistribute um, asylum seekers. So, of course, I mean, yes, this is an area that very much also deals with, with human rights, um, and the EU is, has to be committed to human rights. I mean, we've also seen in, in the previous presentations that this is not, not always, I mean, there, there's a lot of criticism, especially when it comes to pushback actions and what is happening on the Mediterranean. Perhaps there are some better achievements um, in the protection of, of rights, um, in the EU from common minimum standards to perhaps some 
uh, more common standards, perhaps not, not really fully integrated. Um, but, but the big issue really, or the, the, the starting point for cooperation was um, uh, yeah, to achieve a, a redistribution of asylum seekers. And this is very much linked to what um, also Florian mentioned with regard to, to Schengen, right? When the Schengen um, agreement was adopted, there was a concern by member states, especially in Northwestern Europe, that asylum seekers could easily move from, let's say, Italy, to, to anywhere else or, or, or Greece, um, to anywhere else in, in the Northwest of Europe. And so they introduced the, the Dublin regulation. Um, and it's quite interesting if you look into also all early documents on, on um, policy making in this area, but really all the time the, the, the issue of secondary movement comes up. So that's the main concern with Dublin in a way um, to, to ensure that, for example, countries, uh, first countries of entry, uh, countries of entry are responsible uh, to deal with an asylum application. Um, but it also is actually quite um, important on, on, on um, issues of um, harmonization of standards. Um, and, and that leads me already to, to my, uh, my second statement, um, namely that e the EU tried to redistribute asylum seekers through um, regulatory policy making, which is quite a typical thing in the EU. So that sounds a bit technical. But regulatory policy making, in a way, just means that uh, you don't really engage in a, let's say, physical redistribution, both based on quota systems or so, of, uh, of asylum seekers. You don't really agree on how you distribute asylum seekers and refugees, but, but you try to adopt a policy that will then kind of indirectly lead to a redistribution um, of, of asylum seekers. And one way to do so for the EU was always through the harmonization of asylum standards. Um, and here the idea was that if asylum standards protection for asylum seekers across Europe was the same, um, then asylum seekers would stay um, equally happy in, let's say, um, uh, Greece or um, uh, Bulgaria, then they would go to, to, to Sweden. So if the standards were all the same, asylum seekers would, would um, distribute more evenly um, across the EU. Um, and that perhaps gives a very strong role to policies, right? I mean, to what extent are asylum seekers really going to a certain country just based on the policies that the country um, have? There might be family ties there, there might be other reasons, uh, language um, that they speak, or kind of perhaps more generally the, the situation in the country that drives um, asylum seekers to, to go to a certain place and not to another. Um, but again, yeah, kind of design of the, this, this part of the policy was really about um, distributing asylum seekers. And then, of course, Dublin, Florian mentioned the idea of the first country of entry principle also already, that uh, first countries of entry would often or, yeah, be, be in charge of um, processing an asylum application. Um, but um, yeah, um, um, yeah, so that, that, that would, was... Um, a, a kind, kind of the idea. There were, of course, also other reasons of um, um, or other criteria uh, for responsibility, for example, of um, close family links um, that asylum seekers would have there. But it's really a distribution, again, not based on quota system or kind of capacity of countries, but very much along the line of uh, lines of criteria um, and, and regulation. Um, and, and again, this kind of regulatory policy approach to an inherently redistributive, or to achieve an inherently redistributive aim, that's quite common in EU policy making um, since Maastricht, because this was really a time when the EU started um, to make policy on areas of core state powers. So this, these are areas like, um, for example, secure, security and defense policy, where you also don't see a lot of um, integration a lot of there's not a lot of sovereignty transfers to the EU and you also see it in asylum and justice and home affairs uh, more generally because um, yeah here again it's, it's very closely linked to the question of whom you let onto your territory so here member states are also not so keen to for example have an EU agency that deals with um, with asylum applications but really just want to regulate um, perhaps uh, the policies, especially of the other member states, and that this way to, um, want to achieve um, a distribution of asylum seekers that is perhaps in a way more favorable um, to them. Um, and, and reasons for this is really, I mean, on the one hand, again, because it's so close to sovereignty, that's something that voters can, are very much concerned with and, and 
perhaps also are not so happy about when really then the EU takes a lot of um, or a strong role in this. Uh, but also the elites are sometimes not really happy to give away power in this in this area. So what is the problem that results from this? Um, well, if you if you regulate in an area of, I mean, normally EU regulation is really about private, um, yeah, regulating the private sector, whether whether member states would then oversee the implementation in the in the private sector. But here it's in a way the the the, the, the let's say the kind of national authorities that have to oversee their own implementation, and that's that's really a, um, a problem then when it comes to enforcement. And we've seen that the EU has had a lot of problems actually in this area uh, with implementation. We have nice policies on paper, but but very often when it comes to implementation of standards, um, there, there are many more problems here. Um, and additionally, and this is also something that we saw in the in, in 2015. Um, the issue of actual distribution has never been uh, been addressed, um, and and there has never been really a consensus among member states that they want a redistribution of asylum seekers. Um, and um, yeah, so my third statement really is that EU asylum policies they fail because they um, they try to regulate through this regulatory approach, try to redistribute asylum seekers, but there's really a lack of agreement um, on the redistributive con consequences. And um, that is also especially uh, problematic um, in, in, in times of populism. Um, and, and, and this is really the, the conflict that result, results from the design flaws. Um, and, um, and one big problem here, and this is also something that Florian has mentioned, is that there's really no EU level um, capacity, no EU agency that, that oversees the implementation. Um, uh, again, now we have an EU agency, actually. That's a very new uh, evolution. So maybe, maybe that can actually change something. Because um, otherwise, we have very different uh, approaches to, to asylum recognition, very different recognition rates. And then the, uh, the second um, uh, problem related to this is that um, we've seen in 2015-16 that member states, um, yeah, they are not happy with the redistributive implications. And we've seen, for example, that southern member states uh, under Dublin have actually been waving through asylum seekers, so they have not uh, complied with EU law. But also the Visegrad countries, for example, were not really happy with relocation. Um, and here we have to say that's not only something that they do perhaps because, because they have populist governments now, but um, it is also something that I've been very much concerned with uh, when there were other debates about um, having perhaps more um, solidarity in 2012 already. There they were also not, um, not really happy with, with the idea of um, having a redistribution. Um, so again, this has not been addressed, and that's that's really part of a um, of a big um, underlying um, uh, conflict. And then, of course, um, yeah, in 2016, um, when when the negotiations um, around the kind of um, the reform of the Common European Asylum System took place, there we also had uh, populist governments in, in power. And of course, um, this this means much more conflict, even kind of these governments using the reform to uh, to create uh, further conflict. Okay, I think I, I leave it at that and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Natasha. Um, I, I see you returned quite extensively to the, to the issue around solidarity as, as well. Um, um, I also was very interested in your, um, um, in your point about the European Union Asylum Agency, which has just come uh, into operation, and uh, and I think it is a it is a fair question to ask whether it is likely to make any difference um, in the implementation um, deficits that uh, we have been able to observe over over the years. And I would I would be interested in in your assessment, um, um, not just you, Natasha, but the other panel members as as well. The, the other question that that struck me when listening to um, all of your intervention and uh, was the that there there was an issue around I guess counterfactuals for me right um, so we, we talked about the the, the impact the success, success and failure of the use um, kind of policy emerging policy regime more broadly we also talked about the role of Dublin especially when it comes to kind of redistributive and distributive issues. Um, and I wonder whether it, 
might be worth reflecting on the, the question of what would a Europe look like without um, the EU doing what it does in the asylum and immigration field? Um, what would the distribution of asylum seekers and refugees look like in the absence of Dublin, let's say, and in the absence of a, of a regime where it isn't mostly the country of first entry responsible um, for uh, asylum claims. Um, and maybe that might also help us in our thinking about the, I guess, ongoing reform attempts and what might be a more effective and fairer uh, system of, um, of allocating responsibilities um, across the, the European Union. I'll, I'll briefly give the floor back to um, each of our speakers. Um, um, you're welcome to respond to uh, some of the remarks that you have heard. You're also welcome to um, maybe respond to um, one of the, or two of the questions that uh, have already been, already been raised. And I see that there are already lots of questions coming in from the audience, so um, um, that promises a lively discussion afterwards. But I'll first give the floor to, to Sophie. Thanks very much, um, Florian. Uh, picking up, sorry, on what uh, on what Florian you had said about um, an assessment of whether some kind of deal might be possible under the French presidency. Um, I do agree with you that um, the discussions are very difficult at the moment, and the possibility of any large scale breakthrough on the pact discussions is very remote. Um, but I think the phase that we're in at the moment is. Sort of trust building phase to try and get EU member states um, back into a, a position where they can at least move forward on some small issues. Um, and one of the possibilities is if there could be some practical move on, on solidarity. Um, we understand what's being discussed at the moment is trying to reach some agreement even amongst a smaller number of EU member states um, on a more formalized relocation process for people who are rescued at sea. Um, and this is something that member states have tried for, for many years to try and pull together. There have been lots of ad hoc schemes. You'll remember there was the Valletta Declaration where five EU member states tried to, tried to get something moving. But it, it may be the progress at the moment is going to need to be uh, by way of baby steps and by way of confidence building measures. So in a way that that's um, that's a long way away from where we were a couple of years ago, where there were grand schemes for large scale law reform and harmonization across the EU. Now it seems like we're in a political, highly po politicized phase of trying to identify small things that perhaps could move ahead uh, on a practical basis. But um, it does look like there might be at least some momentum in the discussions that are happening now under the French presidency on maybe, uh, they call it a step-by-step -step approach, but some uh, movement on, on relocation. It's not what we, it doesn't fit our ambitions as UNHCR. You know, we want to see a proper, comprehensive, well-functioning asylum system within the EU. But we think that there's reason to be optimistic of at least some progress in, in, in this small area. And I think one of the issues that, that's fundamental to all of this is the point that, Natasha, you raised about um, the onward movement issue. And that if we continue to have in the European Union such diverse reception conditions and such diverse standards for asylum seekers, um, it, you know, it's not going to be possible to... Uh, deal with the, the onward movement issue. Um, we know, for example, that in the, in the European Union, it's, it's really a handful of EU member states that receive the bulk of, of asylum applications in the EU, and the vast majority in, in Germany, of course, and then um, we have Spain and, and France and, um, and uh, yeah, Sweden to a certain extent, uh, member states who are receiving uh, larger numbers of applications. Um, but there are many EU member states, of course, who receive no applications whatsoever. And unfortunately, the trend seems to have been that for states that might wish to avoid having uh, many member states, uh, many asylum seekers coming to their state, 
having a poor level of protection in their country assists that political end. And in fact, countries where um, the standards fall very, very low, those are countries that are protected from having asylum seekers transferred back to those countries because courts uh, rightly won't allow asylum seekers to be transferred to countries where the standards are so low. So harmonization is really key. And the European Union Asylum uh, Agency for Asylum, the new EUAA, which started in January, holds some promise here. But unfortunately, as part of the political deal to get uh, an agreement on the EUAA coming into effect, the monitoring mechanism part of that deal has been suspended uh, until a future point in time, around two years time. Um, when that function starts, that perhaps could really help to bring in uh, a monitoring regime that can hold states to account when it comes to the standards that they need to deploy. The EUAA will also have a fundamental rights officer. It'll have a beefed up uh, consultative forum where NGOs can uh, hopefully make more of an impact on asylum policy. So there are some small things um, that, that give us some reason to, to have some light at the end of the tunnel, but um, it looks like progress is, is going to be slow. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and you already partly addressed um, one of the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Maya Karp was asking about the, the prospect of um, the European Union asylum agency um, making a difference in uh, the harmonization, not just of kind of policies, but also kind of outcomes on the on, on the ground. Um, I'll hand over to, to Florian. Um, Florian. Yeah, no, I, I completely go uh, along with what Sophie said. I think, I mean, the EU agency for asylum, I think it's, it's a very fine agency. I know a few people there, they, they try to do their best, but I think with this agency, with other means that the Commission are doing, they are providing operational technical support money. Uh, the issue is always if there's really no political will or a, a common understanding that the system is fair and should be uh, respected by all participating member states, you always come only as far with this kind of technical operational support measures. You could see this, for instance, as well in the case, case of Greece, so in 2011, there was a famous judgment, MSS versus uh, Greece. Uh, they, uh, so it was an Afghan asylum seekers entering the EU through Greece, went to Belgium. Belgium wanted to send him back according to the Dublin rules. Uh, the asylum seeker took a lawyer. They went to the old courts. They said it's known that the reception systems in Greece are, are not basically not up to European standards. The court said, yes, uh, there is a risk of uh, degrading inhuman treatment of sending this migrant back to Greece. So Greece was out of the Dublin system for some years. Uh, and the other member states, certainly they were not happy with this. And the commission, they tried to, to give a lot of expertise, help. If you read the reports through the years, there was never a lack of technical support, operational support, money to build it up. But it was, in a, in a way, it was a perverse incentive for Greece not to have a well-functioning system because they, they were not so keen to have Dublin working again so that the others could send the migrants back. Uh, so I think this is, in a way, highlighting some basic contradictions in the system and the use asylum systems. Okay, they are technical support, but as long as the basic contradictions are not solved, uh, we can only get that far, I think. And with regard to the second question, what would happen if there is no Dublin? Uh, and it comes to my mind when you said there were a few years ago, the, the European Parliament ordered a few reports about Dublin, the migration system. And I think IQ, you wrote one of them, you co-authored one, another was written by Francesco Maiani. And, and in this report, there was also some this thought experience. Uh, and he said, for instance, uh, if I remember well, uh, uh, that in the end, it probably wouldn't make so much difference if you don't have Dublin. Uh, most migrants would go to Germany and a few other states and uh, and very few to the states that have very few asylum seekers anyway. So and in, indeed it's true if you look at the numbers for instance in Germany uh, it's 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 not necessarily as you would expect that Dublin is working. So Germany has as many or a few years ago with a colleague of mine Philipp Stutz we looked at the numbers so it has almost exactly the same number of Dublin incoming migrants than outgoing migrants. So it's not always that Germany sends back 
asylum seekers to Italy or to, I don't know, Austria, Hungary, whatever. There are a lot of people coming into Germany too. It, I think it, in this case, it was also the, the, the emergency relocation scheme that counted in, uh, but it's still, I mean, Dublin has been framed by some as a kind of a zero sum system in which a lot of energy money is spent on tracing secondary movement and all the things. And it would be, there would be probably uh, easier system if you would let it go a bit, you know, or I, I mean, Mayane, for instance, proposed a Dublin minor system that uh, they can, asylum seekers can have three choices and then you let them go to one of the three choices where there are still places, something like this, an easier system with more choices for asylum seekers. And you may get outcomes that are after all, not so difficult, uh, different to what we are seeing already right now. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Um, Natasha. Yeah, and on the last point, I can actually only echo what um, Florian just said. Um, I mean, um, if, if you really kind of the, the, the main asylum seeker or refugee destinations are still this, the same. Of course, uh, because of Dublin, border countries in recent years have received more asylum seekers or more asylum seekers were stuck there for some time. Uh, but, but that's probably the, the only um, effect. It doesn't otherwise um, affect uh, the distribution so much. And a couple of years ago, I did interviews with um, policymakers and asked them, but why do you keep it anyways if it doesn't make any sense? And, and, and they said, oh, it's, it's mainly a signaling tool to uh, signal to voters that we have this in, in control um, uh, or to, to signal to, to refugees um, and asylum seekers that they can't choose. Um, but it's, it, it really has mainly, that's, that's the main purpose of it. It's more about signaling something that actually um, a policy having um, an effect. Um, and I, I have a, a quick question, um, perhaps to um, Sophie, um, namely, um, you mentioned um, also the EU's role in, in the global um, dimension and, and responsibility sharing. And I was wondering, from your perspective, has um, 2015 made it easier or more difficult um, to advocate for um, resettlement, for example, um, in Europe? So resettlement from, from other countries in the global south. Thank you, Natasha. Um, and I'm happy for maybe Sophie to quickly take that question and then I'll open it up to uh, some of the many questions that we've already received in the in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, Sophie, do you want to just briefly talk about the, the resettlement issue? Sorry. Thanks. I'll, I'll be very quick so we can go to the questions. Um, Yes, I, I think that the EU member states have definitely increased their commitment to resettlement since 2015. Um, in 2014-2015, it was around 8,000 uh, refugees that would be resettled every year, maybe a little bit more. Um, and that rose then to a commitment of around about 25,000 per year um, in 2020-2021. Um, 2021, indeed, the, the EU had hoped to resettle around 30,000 refugees. So we saw an increase. Um, now, COVID, unfortunately, had a very negative impact um, on those commitments. But we are seeing um, a return by the, by the European Union member states to uh, resettlements in the order of around 20,000, 25,000 refugees in 2022. It's not enough. It's still not enough. Um, but um, I think it, this is seen as one way by the EU member states to show um, some commitment. And what we have to be very careful of is our position as UNHCR is that resettlement is not a substitute for um, spontaneous arrivals of asylum seekers. Um, we're watching with some concern discussions on this in the UK, for example. So um, we constantly send the message that we need enhanced uh, resettlement numbers and, and we're beginning to see that in the EU but we need much more um, but also EU member states need to understand this is not an either or issue it's more resettlement and it's better management of, of asylum arrivals. Thank you thank you Sophie I think there, there, there is indeed a risk um, that, um, that some member states might feel it's an it's an either or and that on balance they prefer resettled refugees rather than um, unpredictable kind of asylum numbers that might vary a lot um, over, over, over time. So I think it is, uh, it is important to, to, to make sure that it does not become an either or. I think I would completely agree with you with, on that. 
Um, let me let me take a, a few questions from um, the the audience. There there have been a, a number, um, and I'll I'll try and, and bunch a few to to together. Um, there is certainly some um, who have asked questions um, like Ewan and and, and Daniela um, about um, the the Belarus issue and issues around the weaponization and instrumentalization of um, uh, of, of migration and um, and I think um, there is a there's a fair question to be asked uh, how the EU should or can respond um, to these uh, challenges. I think there might also be a question of how new this, this is a phenomenon and Ewan was suggesting in his question that maybe uh, this is not the first time that, uh, that, we, that, that we have seen um, these, these kind of developments. Um, there's also a question from Holly about um, the, the UK issue and the, the situation in the channel um, and, and whether there continues to be a role for the EU in, in the management of um, cross-channel um, migration flows, or whether now that the UK has left the um, the EU, whether this is really just a matter of bilateral um, re relations, I think that uh, might also be something um, of, um, of 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 interest. Um, and then um, who was it? I think it was um, Kevin. Um, who asked the question about uh, the future of, of Schengen. Um, we heard the linkages between Dublin and, and Schengen in a number of your contributions. Um, we've just heard uh, President um, Macron talk about the um, new creation of a Schengen Council. Um, and I, um, I would be interested also to hear about what you think about the, the future of Schengen and, and whether these new instruments that are on the cards um, and are being discussed within the French presidency um, are likely to, to make any, any difference. Um, maybe we'll, we'll start with that, um, have a first, first round. Um, can I start with you, Sophie? Um, and um, I'll, I'll go through um, and give the others a word as well in a moment. Thanks, Psycho. You'd like me to address some of these questions? I'm still muted. Yes, that would that would be great. Um, so if, if we, I, I, I tried to mention those three initial ones, yeah. um, and um, you don't have to cover all of those. But if you if you have thoughts on on any of them, uh, I would be very interested in your in your views. Thanks, Psycho. I I had a look at these actually while some of them were were coming up. Um, we do have an interesting one as well about the particular situation of the UK and the EU in terms of migrant deaths uh, in the English Channel. Um, from the point of view of, of UNHCR, I mean, we really need to see some progress on this issue. Um, there are, of course, uh, as I'm sure uh, the other members of the panel and, and people online will be aware, there are unfortunately some constraints um, in terms of the legal arrangements post Brexit on, on what can be done. but. Um, we and many others are convinced that a solution needs to be found. Um, unfortunately, post-Brexit and with the UK being outside of the Dublin arrangements, um, we now have a situation where there are people who um, would previously have entitlements to family reunion in the UK under Dublin, now without any legal mechanism under which um, that can be pursued. Um, so I think there's going to need to be a, a creative approach uh, to finding answers to that. And, and also we have seen some indications um, from, from France and the UK that they want to try and pursue um, some level of agreement. Clearly, a new legally binding agreement um, would, would require all the EU member states um, getting involved because this is an area of competence of, of, um, of EU asylum law. Um, but there needs to be some progress made and we would encourage uh, all those parties involved to, to keep the discussions going because solutions must be found. Um, in terms of the, the experience of, of contemporary asylum migration issues for the future of, of EU Schengen, 
Um, I think one of the things that's been very good to see is that even though there's been quite divisive discussions on what happened at the EU uh, borders with, um, uh, with Belarus in particular, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland, um, the European Commission, when it came up with a proposal to address that issue, this also addresses another question which came in about the issue, um, it's termed instrumentalization of, 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 of refugees and migrants. Um, when the Commission came forward with a proposal to address that, um, even though some of the countries concerned wanted the Commission to go so far as to say that in some situations, meaning where there is instrumentalization, however you want to determine that, where that exists, that the right to asylum should be suspended. Some member states were pushing that agenda, um, but that did not come forward in the European Commission's proposal. There may be lots of other things that people have concerns about, but that proposal made clear that the right to asylum cannot be suspended under any circumstances. And that's very important for the Schengen border regime because in the Schengen border code, there is a clear legal rule that um, whatever other obligations are on member states to manage their border, to control their border, they must comply with the prohibition of refoulement which means that anybody who might be in need of protection needs to be admitted to the territory. They can't just be refused as, you know, irregular or in their term, uh, Ill illegal migration. So um, the, uh, the re-emphasis of the importance of the prohibition of non-refoulement will have a lasting impact on any Schengen reform that will come forward. And it's why it's very important that even though they are separate systems, that the Schengen system and the common European asylum system uh, clearly maintain that those people in need of protection need to have access to the border and that Schengen cannot be a blockage to that. But clearly as well, in order to maintain a healthy Schengen regime, we need to have much better managed borders and much better managed asylum procedures and more harmonized safeguards across the EU in order to try and uh, manage onward movement or to reduce the reasons why asylum seekers are compelled to engage um, in onward movement. Um, in terms then also of the question about the future, and maybe I'll, I'll leave it there and hand over to, um, to some others. In terms of the future uh, of, of the EU asylum policy, um, yes, there is a big focus at the moment on the external dimension. We can see this in the discussions that are taking place. Um, from a UNHCR point of view, we do want to see uh, protection space grow so that more countries put in place good quality asylum systems and that when people flee uh, for their lives that they can more quickly access protection. That, that's very, very important. Um, there have been some states, the UK has been involved in some of these discussions as well, but some EU member states have been talking about uh, proposals that, that many would term externalization. So meaning trying to um, divest the EU's asylum responsibilities to other countries, countries in Africa or countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and so far, at least, I think there have been, um, there is a majority of EU member states, but also um, a position that's held within the Commission, within the European Parliament and other services that EU law currently um, and possibly forever, uh, would not allow for an asylum seeker who arrives to the European Union to be transferred to some other country where they've never been for their, for their claim to be looked at. So at least for now, that more extreme form of externalization is, is still seen um, as being uh, a step too far. Um, but there is a risk with um, failure to make good progress on the pact um, and with um, some member states really pushing this externalization agenda that some of these ideas can get traction. And that's why it's very important for us to, or for European Union member states to move quickly to, to put in place um, arrangements within the EU that, that can function and can function well. I'll have a read through some of the remaining questions that have come in and, and respond in time. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sophie. That, that, that was uh, very, very comprehensive already. Um, Florian, uh, do you have any, any, any thoughts on, um, uh, in particular, those, those three sets of questions that I, that I initially raised? Uh, 
but feel free to obviously expand on those as well. Yeah, I will start as well with the kind of instrumentalization of migra migration. Uh, there was an author called Green Hill. So she wrote in 2010 a book called Weapons of Mass Migration. So uh, it's, uh, it's a book that shows post-World War II, and I think she comes up with more than 70 instances uh, in which migration has been instrumentalized in, in one way or another. So in a way, what we are seeing right now, or what we saw uh, at the polish lithuanian uh, Belarusian border was nothing particularly new. Uh, I think there were a few new elements, at least to my knowledge, that you really proactively in such a scale fly in migrants and, and, and bring them to the border was uh, a new element in scale. Uh, but in the dynamic, uh, I think uh, it's not completely uh, uh, a completely unexperienced exp uh, uh, event. Uh, what can be done, I think, and here Sophie also said it, the challenge is there always to maintain true to your values and the norms that you have, while still uh, also to some extent uh, issuing uh, uh, your concerns that are well founded i think it's it's fair it's a fair concern of governments not to 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 let yourself uh being brought in a situation like lukashenko and his regime is being brought but i think what we risk seeing is that uh uh measures that are very extreme you know this kind of pushbacks that we saw at large scale in such a border crisis are still kind of getting normalized uh, and is finding the backdoor ways in one way or another, either in domestic, but in this case, it was even called for into European legislation. Uh, and once, if you open the small doors, uh, it, it sometimes happened that over time, the door is being pushed more and more. So I think uh, uh, that's, that's the big risk in such a, in such a, a crisis. So I think it makes more sense in this case, what the EU did to really try to, to, in this case, cooperate with, for instance, the Iraqi government and saying, you know, go directly to where the migrants are being flown uh, into Belarus and try to, to change things there. I mean, they worked as well a lot on transit flights through, through Istanbul airport. And at the same time, you know, not allowing yourself being brought so easily uh, in, in, in such a situation. I mean, it would always help to have a better functioning uh, uh, internal asylum system that uh, not all your thoughts are on the external border and your concerns that, uh, yeah, let's try at all costs to avoid that uh, numbers are even slightly increasing there. So that's my thought uh, on, the, on this point. Uh, let me continue with the, the UK-EU cooperation. Uh, I think if you look at the numbers in, in recent years, the, the UK number of asylum seekers would be very average European value. I think they would be ninth, tenth uh, member states, I mean, compared relative to population. Uh, so there are many, or it's a very common feeling in the EU that the sense of crisis that Boulevard yellow press in the UK is drawing often about uh, the asylum theme is something that is not very well understood here. It's exaggerated and uh, there is, I mean, Sophia, or I don't know if you disagree, but I, I have the impression there is little sense appetite right now to come easily to help to the UK. Uh, first, given the old Brexit context, and secondly, given that in Europe, very few see this as an emergency case. So uh, there was, the UK government was always very, very happy with the Dublin regime, a uh, little surprisingly. I mean, it always gave them the legal means to basically ask for a transfer of asylum seekers back to other EU states. Right now, they have to negotiate a fresh either with the EU or with individual member states to try to go with individual member states. Uh, then it's, it's a question, I mean, of, of interstate negotiations. Do you have uh, incentives? Do you have, I mean, <laughs> why, do you, why do you think that the others will make it? It's not so difficult, uh, different after all between Greece and Turkey and uh, or Greece and, or the Italy, Tunisia. You know, you try basically to convince your neighbors to, uh, to help you uh, dealing better with a, with a topic that you consider very important domestically, 
but with the other uh, partner sometimes thinks it's not such a big issue for you after all i think that's my reading of the eu uk uh, situation and finally the schengen yeah i mean schengen is is difficult right now i mean it's this past dependency you have created it uh, i think it could have created differently uh, with a much you know with schengen members having a clearer responsibilities in the migration field too that this kind of shirking of responsibilities and and getting away with non-compliance with anything is is more easily being punished i think it's very difficult right now to come up with something similar to schengen that is better functioning right now that you have already schengen because there's a lot of economic interests there too the reform of schengen I know, I mean, we see right now this Macron ideas and, and Schengen Council, we really have to wait what's coming out there. Sometimes Macron is known to have big ideas, big, I mean, but sometimes, I mean, if you look how many of these ideas are really worked out in detail after some years, sometimes the results may be a bit more sober than, uh, than the big ideas. Let's see, I hope for the best here, but I, 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 will, I will wait. Thank you, Florian. Uh, Natasha, do you have uh, thoughts on this initial set of questions? Um, I think, I mean, mo most uh, questions have been uh, addressed. So I, I move perhaps to the to the question on the external dimension that also um, Sophie talked about. And I think this is quite interesting because the EU has obviously, I mean, now that it's so hard to come uh, to an agreement in the internal dimension, that's that's usually the situation when the EU then kind of turns to the external dimension and thinks, okay, maybe maybe we can achieve uh, more cooperation um, here. But um, I mean, besides the fact that it doesn't necessarily address any of the internal problems and the EU still remains very much kind of um, unfit to, to similar um, situations um, in the future than uh, to 2015, it also, of course, I mean, just because the EU wants to have external processing of um, of asylum applications in, in other countries, which is very problematic for, for lots of reasons. But I mean, just because the EU wants this doesn't mean that other countries are happy to uh, be kind of the new um, hotspot where asylum applications are processed um, outside the EU. So that's that's one big thing, right? Also, um, after the um, after 2015, the EU wanted to have lots of return and readmission agreements. And of course, I mean, certain countries don't want to have or conclude these agreements um, with the EU. So, um, yeah, so in, in that regard, I think external policy making is very challenging because you obviously also need um, the consent of other countries and they might not be so happy uh, to cooperate with the EU in that regard. Um, um, either. So that's that's probably one of the big challenges. And then obviously there are a host of human rights challenges. Um, if you think of cooperation with Turkey, but also Libya, um, there's obviously a, a lot that is that is criticized um, for, for a good reason. Um, yeah, and I think I leave it, I leave it there. Thank you, Natasha. We've certainly also seen here in the UK debate, right, that sometimes the, the cooperation of third countries is uh, almost taken for granted when big announcements are policy announcements are being made um, and then we see a rapid rowing back of, of initiatives when uh, it turns out that actually agreement with the country is not yet in place on some of these uh, initiatives. Um, I wanted to come to a couple of other questions that have been raised. Um, um, Fabian, for example, he uh, raised um, the question again about um, solidarity and how this kind of Gordian knot uh, that we have in the in the EU about uh, resolving kind of redistributive issues, right, where you have kind of zero sum games between potential um, winners and 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 losers of, of new arrangements can be can be overcome. Um, I think Andrew also followed up on this and asked questions about um, kind of sanctioning mechanisms and how credible they are and whether they are likely to be effectively used. Um, we've had discussions in recent weeks, right, about maybe withholding EU funds from some member states who are not playing ball, are not kind of um, doing their part um, in um, making progress on some of these um, solidarity and other, other issues. So that's the first set of, of, of question. Um, 
another question that was raised by Al Medina. Um, why does the EU focus so much on return? Um, and Natasha just, just mentioned that. And why have we seen so few efforts to create more legal pathways when everybody agrees that obviously the, the lack of legal pathways into the European Union are partly responsible right, for some of the calamities that we've seen in the Mediterranean and on other external border points of, of the EU. Um, and, um, and then a question perhaps particularly to, to Sophie um, by Anthony about um, the UNHCR's thinking of uh, about um, climate refugees um, and issues around, I guess, new, I guess, challenges, new um, reasons for, for uh, um, displacement that perhaps uh, neither EU or, nor, um, I guess, international law have responded particularly well so far to yet. And um, I would be interested also to, to hear your thoughts on uh, how that might be addressed more effectively in the, in, in the future. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with, um, um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it to those three main themes. But if you, if you saw anything else that struck your interest, feel free obviously to jump on those as well. Sophie, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks a lot, Aiko. Um, on the climate refugees issue, um, UNHCR has a, appointed a special advisor on this issue, and we're working very closely with EU institutions and other partners to try and uh, make some advances. Um, one of the key things we're looking at is the existing legal um, conventions and arrangements that are in place, um, because many people who are forced to flee because of climate reasons um, sometimes there can be a, let's say, Geneva Convention reason linked to that or other reasons um, for which they would be able to um, avail of international protection or subsidiary protection. Um, some people who are fleeing climate change, um, there are right to life issues there, there are right to freedom from uh, torture and human degrading treatment or punishment. Um, so we're, we're looking at the existing legal framework with a view to seeing how best that can be used. Um, and part of the reason for doing that is that there is not um, a big appetite in the international community at the moment to open up a new legal instrument. We have to look at, at using what we have at the moment um, to, to try and advance that. Um, it also, I think the, the climate issue is, is intimately linked as well to the pathways issue, which, which you have mentioned. And there was another question by, by Amelia in relation to Afghanistan, and is there something that we can learn from that? The Afghan experience, um, as, uh, as horrendous as it was, um, did indicate that when states are under pressure, evacuations can be facilitated through a range of, of, of different measures. And one of the things um, that did emerge from that is that the European Union member states can admit uh, people who have been evacuated from Afghanistan, if they're transiting through another country, they can be can considered as part of humanitarian admission. That just unlocks some options for funding for them. It unlocks some op options for, for, um, for other supports from the European Union for those kinds of initiatives. Um, so it, it, in a way, there may be some positive practice that, that can be built. Um, there's also the usual lessons that need to be learned about the chaotic implementation of those programs and the lack of prioritization and also the lack of supports for people on arrival. I think we've learned enough about complementary pathways that um, when people are admitted to countries in the European Union, the UK or beyond, there need to be um, already agreements on the status that they will receive. They need to have support of the local community. And unfortunately for, for, for many evacuees, that's not been the case. So, so some lessons to be learned there. Um, but also I think what we, what we need to do is increase, in addition to evacuations, um, complementary pathways such as access to um, the labor market, student visas, and a range of other ways in which people can travel in dignity. And there's some, some good work going on in the UK on labor mobility with organizations such as Talent Beyond Boundaries um, and others. There was a question there as well from Andrew Connolly about sanctioning of, of pushbacks. 
Um, we've seen quite a quite a move in European Union circles at the moment and quite a lot of discussions around sanctioning member states for breaches of rule of law. And there'll be a big dis dis uh, decision coming out from the Court of Justice of the European Union um, on Wednesday of this week in relation to the rule of law mechanism uh, and its use to financially sanction states that, that don't keep their part of the deal when it comes to rule of law. We don't yet see political appetite for, for that kind of measure extending to, to pushbacks. The options that are there on the table, of course, are legal actions before the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, there are an increasing number of cases now uh, that have been communicated to the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, several cases on um, quite extensive uh, pushback cases. So uh, those cases will go through the Strasbourg Court. Um, that is a legal sanctioning of, of some kind. Um, it's a small quantum when it comes to money, but it's an important legal action. But there are, are more possibilities uh, before the, the Court of Justice of the European Union. What's really lacking is EU member states challenging each other on these pushback practices. We have seen some condemnation coming from parts of the European Commission. We've seen the European Parliament being very active, but we're not seeing states stepping up and challenging other states engaging in these practices at the European Council level. Um, and we also see a vacuum uh, at the governance level, let's say of the Frontex Management Board or the European Union Agency for Asylum, where states really uh, need to step up in relation to those issues. And I think there was also a series of questions to me in relation to the um, uh, Belarus, uh, yes, the response to the, to the Belarusian border and the prospects for mandatory border procedures being successful. Unfortunately, what we have seen in the, in the response is legislation passed in the countries concerned and also practices which are essentially non-entree uh, policies. Um, and what we actually want to see instead of that is member states meeting their existing obligations and admitting people to the territory and then undertaking procedures. Um, as UNHCR, we're very much in favor of procedures being available when people first arrive in a country to be registered, to be referred into the right procedure um, so that asylum procedures can start as quickly as possible. So we are in favor of that um, and very disappointed to see that in the case of the arrivals or the attempted arrivals from Belarus, that those obligations weren't met by the member states concerned. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the, the second part of that question, um, it, there, there was, I think, quite a lot of reflection within uh, the EU institutions in Brussels in 2017, 2018, as to whether coming up with a whole raft of legal proposals in 2016 was the right way to go. Um, often we see in the European Union that the response to um, large crises when it comes to the asylum or migration field, the response is legislative. And um, we, we saw it again, at the Belarus border issue, where the European Union member states invited the Commission to come up with legal proposals to deal with the situation there. They have come forward with proposals, but the member states are divided on those proposals. All of that detracts attention away from the real issue, which is implementing the existing law, respecting the fundamental rights regime, um, and, and trying to make progress. So we're very conscious that legal reform can often be um, uh, the wrong area of focus when we're trying to make progress. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Florian. Yeah, I think Sophie responded very comprehensively already. Just a few points to add. The solidarity, I, I completely uh, agree with her. I think it's really an issue that member states don't create this pressure on their fellow uh, um, states. Uh, you have seen this in the in the rule of law mechanism. There was a lot of demand from the Netherlands, from others, that this is really implemented, and the Commission has used it to, to create it. And that on the mechanism, it has taken years and years that it really took off. Finally, right now, okay, it's judicially challenged, but uh, there are many expectations that it will then be uh, in place. Uh, with the migration field, is not so much. I mean, to put it bluntly, I think other member states they don't say it so openly, but uh, they don't are so much, you know, 
de facto against the practices that some of their external border colleagues basically implement, so long as it keeps migration numbers in their own territories uh, at a low level. Uh, that's why the, the pressure is not so much uh, so high. I think the Commission tries uh, to, uh, to follow up uh, and to, uh, to bring these cases to court. Uh, but uh, if it has not the packing of a critical mass in the Council, it stands relatively alone there. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, think of Poland. Uh, the Commission has already uh, conflicts on a whole number of issues. Do they want really right now to uh, to open up the migration field as a major another conflict with the with the government? So I think this are some of the concerns that they're having. Uh, why is return such uh, or given so much weight? Uh, I think it's it's a basic rationale of the EU's uh, immigration system. Uh, to believe that all those who have entered the European Union on fake protection claims or in an irregular manner have to be returned. Otherwise, the whole legitimacy of the system may be undermined. That's the belief. Uh, you can critically uh, question it uh, because there's a lot of energy being invested in bringing them, them back, these migrants back, uh, and the return rate is relatively low. I mean, it's between 30 and 40 percent, something like this. Uh, but that's the, 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 the key uh, uh, line of reasoning there. Why there are so few legal pathways? Uh, I think uh, the simple answer is just to refer to the most domestic discourse in some member states. I mean, in the French election right now, everybody's talking about this poll, uh, I mean, this Seymour uh, as a candidate who is just riding on this immigration issue. So I think any measure that is considered liberal by governments is then being exploited by these challenger parties or challenger uh, uh, candidates. Uh, and it's very difficult for, uh, for governments then to, to open up legal pathways. I mean, scholars have said there is a structural element, even of low skilled migration. You know, if you don't allow it, they will come anyway, but they will come in irregular manners. So it's much better to regularize it. Uh, and actually, the Commission tries in the new pact to, to tackle also legal pathway for lower skilled migrants. Uh, but the level of support uh, uh, among member states is still not very high. Uh, but uh, I think that's the, it has to be explained by the political pressure coming from different sides. I will stop. Thank, thank, thank you, Florian. Um, and Natasha, I'll, I'll give you the final word. We're almost out of time, I can, I can see. But, uh, but please uh, feel free to, to respond to whichever. Yeah, maybe. Maybe on the on the question of um, climate refugees, because this is also quite interesting from an, let's say, migration studies perspective. Interestingly, many migration scholars are a bit hesitant when it comes to speaking about um, uh, climate refugees. And I think what they would suggest is that um, often when, when people um, flee due to um, environmental stress, actually kind of governance structures um, and political um, um, issues play a role as well. It's never only the environment that makes someone flee, but it's really kind of um, yeah, a host of, of factors um, that make environmental stress such a big issue that then people, um, uh, people flee. And that obviously the decision to, to leave um, or to migrate is very complex. And kind of speaking about um, climate refugees would perhaps um, um, undermine this. I think also some of the literature suggests that um, yeah, um, there is, as, as Sophie mentioned, um, a lack of um, appetite um, um, uh, for um, cooperation on this issue at the global level, especially if you think about, again, populists uh, in, in government and in various countries that also undermined in a way the, the migration um, um, compact. Um, and there are some suggestions on, for example, other ways of doing this perhaps not so much at a, at a global level uh, with international frameworks, but um, there are some initiatives, for example, more um, ad hoc based and in, at a regional level, or some um, legal scholars also to suggest that there is actually already perhaps a basis for this in international human rights law, and that could be interpreted by courts in a more liberal way to also encompass uh, um, people fleeing um, envir environmental stress and, and um, climate disasters. Okay, okay. I think... Uh, just finished on time. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, um, I also saw that um, some of you um, answered questions in, in writing on the 
on the Q and A platform. Thank you, thank you for my, for that. Um, there, there are a number of questions that unfortunately we didn't have a chance to 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 get to. Interesting questions about the relationship between UNHCR and and the EU, um, but also I guess uh, questions about the impact of COVID um, that Genevieve just just raised. Unfortunately, um, we, we we are out of time, but. Hopefully, we'll have another chance to continue these, these discussions.